Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to our biweekly CMFI MassPEC seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have uh, uh, Vadim Demichev today giving uh, the lecture. So for those of you who do not know him, uh, Vadim has a PhD um, in statistics and more on the, on the math side, but then uh, did a postdoc in uh, yeah, like more applied research uh, towards proteomics uh, at the University of Cambridge and then uh, at the Francis Crick Institute before he then moved to um, Berlin at the Charité where he now leads the uh, MSTARS uh, uh, junior group, I think. And yeah, I think most importantly, uh, he's he's known or well-known now for being the main developer of Diane, one of like the uh, DIA data analysis tools in uh, proteomics. And yeah, was uh, was that. I'm very much looking forward to his lecture on DIA and high throughput proteomics. Vadim, the floor is yours. Daniel, many thanks for the invitation and, and the introduction. And it's, it's a pleasure to present at the seminar. So um, I would like to talk about some technical aspects of data independent acquisition and discuss why it's a deal method in many scenarios for high throughput proteomics and high sensitivity proteomics and combining those. And um, this, this will be a, a bit on the technical side, so I will not give um, lots of examples of how we could use that and for, um, for, for, the, for the sake of time. And uh, here's the plan for my today's talk. So I'll give a brief overview of uh, DIA in general, how it compares to DDA, and why we can prefer one method over another method. And uh, briefly introduce Diane. So this is our software for analyzing almost any kind of DIA data. And uh, then I'll discuss uh, what parameters actually determine the performance of a DA method, so how to optimize it for a particular scenario, and also some recent computational developments which allow cool new things. And uh, finally, I would like to finish with uh, introducing slice passive. So this is new acquisition method we developed in Brooklyn Instruments. Uh, because I also think it illustrates these concepts of what makes DA good nicely. So uh, this is the just just making sensitivity of a proteomics as high as possible. So uh, a brief recap of how proteomics works. So you have your sample, there are protein incidents, and uh, then you digest the sample with an enzyme. So typically people use trypsin, which cuts off the lysins and arginines, and uh, this produces peptides. And those peptides, they're loaded in a chromatography system, which separates them based on their hydrophobicity. Hydrophilic peptides salute first, hydrophobic peptides salute later. And a liquid chromatography system, it's connected to the mass pack. So everything is automated, sampling is automated, uh, loading on liquid chromatography system is automated, and it's like directly connected to the mass pack. So everything happens automatically. And um, at the front end of the mass spec is a device called ion source, which ionizes the peptides. So most often what we see is peptides ionized to charges two or three, sometimes four, very rarely other charges. And uh, the first functional element of the mass spec after the ion source, um, well, for regular uh, proteomics, is uh, the so-called Q1 quadrupole. And this is basically a low resolution mass filter. So what you can do, you can set a mass range and only precursor ions. So these charged peptides are called precursor ions. And I'll explain later why. But, uh, precursor ions, which fall into this mass range, which you said can be a narrow, wide mass range, can be narrow mass range. Only those fly through this quadrupole. Everything else just goes, uh, goes like to the side into a vacuum pump. So some of those precursors fly through and they enter another device called a collision cell where they collide with molecules of a gas and um, this, this causes fragmentation of peptides. So uh, typically what uh, we see in proteomics, what we use is type of fragmentation which just breaks the peptide at, at the peptide bonds and there are N-terminal fragments produced and there are C-terminal fragments produced and they're also charged. So, these fragments are then detected by a high-resolution mass analyzer. Uh, 
So this is uh, so-called a mass a mass acquisition. So when precocines and fragmentines and precocines have been fragmented with the produce of fragmentines. Um, also, there is MS, regular MS acquisition, also called MS1. And this is more simple. So all these uh, ions, which are produced by other ion source, they just fly without uh, um, any significant interaction with anything in the mass spec towards the mass analyzer and are being measured. Now, the way you control this Q1 quadruple, and this can be done with high temporal resolution, so you can change the setting of this quadruple very rapidly. This determines uh, the way the mass spec actually operates and what it can do. And for untargeted proteomics, there are basically two main approaches, data-independent acquisition and data-dependent acquisition. Data-independent, in a sense, is more easy to, to um, and like just a more simple method. So what happens is just the mass spec repeatedly cycles through uh, a predefined set of precocine isolation windows. So first, this quadrupole, a Q1 quadrupole, is isolating precursors in this range, then in this range, then in this range, and so forth. And this forms a cycle, and then proceeds with the next cycle, and the next cycle, and so on. So it's very, very easy to understand the deterministic method. In DDA, it's a bit different. And the mass spec looks at MS1 uh, scan. So it does first MS1 scan, and it says, okay, what are the most abundant precursor ions it sees in MS1 scan? Let's fragment those. And then it isolates those most abundant ions with very narrow isolation windows. So typically one or two Daltons. And uh, the consequence of that is that while in DDA, you record usually one single spectrum per peptide. So you have like different intensities of different fragment ions. Um, in DA, you get elution profiles for your fragment ions because every fragment ion is recorded for every cycle and there are many cycles during the typical elution time of a peptide. What does it lead to? So, in DIA, the spectra are highly multiplexed and highly complex. So each of those spectra, and there are many spectra per evolution profile, each of those is highly complex. Why does it happen? Because multiple peptides are being selected for fragmentation using these fairly wide isolation windows. So it does happen quite often that uh, you see a signal at a particular mass and you think it might be a fragment from one peptide or it might be a fragment from another peptide and you don't really know. And it often happens that uh, what you get is a combined signal from multiple peptides. In DDA, in contrast, what happens is that usually the signal is dominated by this single precursor sign being fragmented, which, which you selected for fragmentation. And because of that, the spectra are typically very nice and clean. So uh, this is the reason why at the dawn of uh, untargeted proteomics, DDA was the method of choice because processing this kind of data is very simple. We just effectively count the fragments uh, which match between a particular spectrum and a particular peptide. You know which theoretical fragments peptide is supposed to produce, and uh, you calculate number of matched fragments for all the peptides in a sequence database, and you just say, okay, for this spectrum, the best match is the peptide with the highest number of matching fragments. Now, of course, DDA methods have advanced quite significantly since, since the beginning, and now very quite complex methods are also used to try to match peptides better, for example, looking at things like um, mass deviation of a particular fragment ion, um, or even looking at retention times and uh, like predicted spectra. But the general principle stays the same. So this is easy to process data. In DIA, in contrast, these highly multiplex spectra are not easy to process. And what also complicates things is the fact that you have them with temporal resolution. So you have not just a single spectrum, but rather a set of spectra, uh, which form what we call a P group. Uh, for each of the fragment ions, uh, for, for each of the precursors. So you have like multiple extracted dilution profiles for different fragment ions. 
and the software needs to make sense of all that. Now, uh, this, this was the disadvantage of DIA, or better to say the challenge of DIA. However, DIA has a uh, quite a range of significant advantages. So one of them is proteomic depth. So typically, and but this depends very strongly on the instrument, the acquisition settings, and the sample type. But typically, DIA achieves better proteomic depth, uh, very often significantly better. And this is one of the examples. So a DIA is in red, number of identifications, and uh, DDA with like two different methods in uh, orange and dark blue. And uh, what the author saw was actually that DIA can, at certain gradients, achieve more perfect identifications than the number of spectra actually acquired with DDA. And of course, DDA, it's not always possible to identify the perfect in particular spectrum. Sometimes it's um, some fancy modification, for example, some glycan on a peptide, which is difficult to identify because you're just not looking for it. Um, sometimes it's something else. Sometimes it's uh, some amino acid substitution or whatever. So uh, it's not trivial to identify all the spectra in DDA experiment. And uh, this, this happens, this advantage of DIA comes from the fact that every single peptide in the particular mass range of interest is being fragmented. So effectively, if your sensitivity is good enough to detect the signal from the fragments of a peptide, then you will be able to identify it in every single run. Whereas in DDA, it's like uh, if you're lucky and the peptide is selected for fragmentation, then yeah, you might be able to identify it. If it's not selected, then you just don't see it. And this also happens stochastically. So uh, this is from a paper from 2015. And the authors compared the number of consistently identified peptides in the experiment, depending on the number of runs in the experiment. And what they saw is that this number of consistent identifications drops a lot for DDA. So here it's called shotgun proteomics. It's another name for DDA. And HRM is the no another name for DIA they used. And uh, in case of DIA, this drop is uh, very insignificant. So the data completeness is a lot, a lot better. Now with DDA, you can use uh, different kinds of methods, which significantly improve data completeness too. Uh, but in general, this is this is a trend. So typically, all things equal, DIA method will produce better data completeness than DDA. Now, another um, advantage of DIA is that uh, just pure signal intensity you record for fragments of a peptide is typically higher. So why does it happen? Uh, in DIA, it's very easy to calculate the MS, MS duty cycle of the method because when the quadrupole is acquiring this kind of isolation window, only peptides which uh, fly in this window, so the precursors which have the mass uh, to charge ratio which falls in this window are being fragmented. Everything else is not being fragmented. It means that MSMS duty cycle is just inversely proportional to the number of isolation windows you use in the cycle. So one over n, where n is, is, is the number of isolation windows. And uh, if we assume, for example, that DDA uses the same accumulation time, so the same time per window, then uh, in DIA you have multiple windows, and they also like, spread all the whole illusion profile. In DDA you have a single spectrum. So on this diagram, uh, the spectrum is actually acquired at the apex, means that uh, uh, the, like we were lucky and uh, uh, the spectrum was acquired where the signal is the most intense. Uh, but it can also be somewhere here, can be somewhere here, easily happens. So not only you have less spectra, but uh, also that not guaranteed to be at the apex. And the total signal often is significantly lower. So this is the disadvantage of DDA when it comes to sensitivity. Uh, this changes uh, somewhat when you use uh, trapped time mobility with, uh, for example, DDA passive. So it's a bit different situation, but still, uh, this is one of the reasons why DIA uh, can usually achieve higher identification numbers also for low abundant samples. Now, another advantage of DIA is the fact that since you get this 
pollution profiles for the fragment ions in addition to MS1 profile here in a dotted line. So MS1 you can get for both DIA and DDA, so it works exactly the same. Um, here you can quantify the MS2 level. In DDA, since this scan can be located anywhere in, in the illusion profile, can be in the beginning, can be in the end, it's, it's impossible to do MS2 level quantification. And it turns out that uh, for most instrument settings, which makes sense, MS2 level quantification works better than MS1 level quantification. So uh, what but the, the most obvious consequence of that is just the precision of quantification is better. And uh, here is DIA to the left, DDA to the right. In DIA, CV value is just a lot, a lot lower. And um, I would like to mention that until recently, uh, DDA data has been searched uh, primarily against the sequence database, while DA data has been searched uh, against the spectral library. So a set of peptides and uh, their known spectra, known retention times. And uh, this spectral library creation process uh, is quite laborious, typically. So uh, this used to be a limitation of DIA, but this is no longer the case. And I'll talk about one of the very nice solutions to this today. So um, in terms of like how, how this method developed, so in, in the beginning, DIA was almost not used. So uh, untargeted proteomics was done primarily with DDA. Then there were a number of landmark papers which established the method, uh, like how to operate the instrument, as well as methods for to process the data. And uh, software tools were developed to deal with DA data. And DA became a valid alternative to DDA, which had its advantages, but also limitations. Then throughout the years, uh, there has been quite rapid progress. So DA was constantly improving. Some limitations went away, some limitations still remained. But today we can say that DIA is applicable to um, like 95% of experiments you might want to do and uh, might be also a method of choice for many experiments. So most limitations have disappeared. And uh, if we look quantitatively in terms of how the numbers of identifications change throughout the time, then uh, just not so long ago in 2015, the state of the art, and this was already DIA, was identifying and quantifying about 4,000 human proteins in a two-hour two chromatographic gradient. And uh, six years afterwards, the state of the art is five million gradient and now 5,000 proteins. So like 20 times faster, but at the same time, better data quality. So tremendous improvement in throughput. And uh, we also, I mean, we keep developing DA methods and um, new and new technologies appear. Um, so library free DA is now possible. We can do multiplexing in certain scenarios. Um, super sensitive workflows based on DIA are also possible. And all this progress is driven by three things. The first is computational methods to process all this complex data, which is generated by DIA acquisition schemes. The second is uh, introduction of new, more sensitive and fast mass spectrometers. And finally, it's new mass spec technologies. So the ways to operate the mass spec or in case of multiplexing to prepare the sample, which will be compatible with DIA. So um, some time ago, we introduced this uh, software suit for processing DIA data, which we call DIAN, uh, which stands for Data Independent Acquisition by Neural Networks. And we published quite a number of technology papers based on that. Uh, the main highlight of our software has been that uh, it effectively enabled fast gradients. So um, this is not the first benchmark we did. So this is from uh, NatureCom's 2022 paper. And uh, this is basically we compared the performance uh, of Diane and alternative software on a slower method. This is 21 million gradient, 60 sample per day method, and the faster method for 5.6 million gradient, 200 sample per day method. And uh, when we look at the number of peptides detected, 1% full discovery rate with a slow method, we saw uh, a moderate advantage of our software, whereas with faster method, it was a huge advantage. So uh, later on, I'll talk a bit how this was possible. 
And uh, just to give you some, some idea of like what, what kind of numbers we get with uh, state-of-the-art instruments and the software, uh, to the left it is an example of uh, numbers from a human sample for long gradient. So it's a Brooker Team Stoff Pro 2 instrument, 90 million gradient uh, nanoflow and library free processing dilution series. And uh, to the right is a uh, reanalysis of public data, again, Team Stoff Pro instrument. Uh, and uh, now it's a microflow system and loading 200 nanograms and different different uh, throughput settings of this system. So, for example, 200 samples per day, so very high throughput. We're getting over 5,000 proteins identified and quantified on average from a helo sample. Um, so this is um, an example of how we can push the throughput to the absolute maximum. And uh, this is currently the fastest plasma proteomic workflow we're using Charité in Berlin. So um, this was achieved by a combination of TeamStock Pro instrument with a high flow, well, analytical flow liquid chromatography system with a half a milliliter minute flow rate. And uh, this is great for applications where you don't need high sensitivity, for example, when working with human plasma, because uh, the, the sample is basically available in unlimited amounts. And um, we were able to get uh, on the system at the throughput of uh, about 400 samples per day on a single instrument, um, identifying just over 5,000 precursors per sample and about 3, protein, uh, 300 proteins per sample. So we did an example study and uh, we did like with slower methods, we did studies where we analyzed like thousands of, uh, thousands of patient samples in experiment. Uh, this is a small scale just to demonstrate the potential of this setup. Uh, there was like uh, 15 healthy participants and uh, 30 COVID patients. So these samples were actually taken at the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020. And um, from this experiment, like measured with this set setup, we were able to identify uh, over 150 proteins differentially abundant, depending on the COVID status and severity. So uh, in general, the method also not just good in terms of um, identifying quite a number of proteins, but also quantifying them precisely enough so that we can easily distinguish between different conditions. So um, what actually determines uh, the performance of DIM effort and how to tune it to a particular experiment. So let's look into this. So the first uh, and maybe the most important factor is probably sensitivity. So this is actually ability to detect a meaningful signal for the precursor in itself at MS1 level, but most importantly for its fragment times. So a mass mass sensitivity is maybe the most important thing in um, identifying precursors using DIA because this is this is the way we get actual sequence information about the precursor. Fragmentines tell us uh, which which amino acids are where in the, in the, in the sequence. And what we need is a signal which is strong enough so that we actually see something appearing at a particular mass and also we need the signal to be strong in comparison to whatever noise there is so how to achieve it um like the the obvious solution is that if you are able to inject high amount of sample so you just have a lot of ions to begin with and use low flow rate chromatography system like none of like sub microliter per minute flow rates on typical non LC system. And low flow rate ensures that the concentration of the sample, the ion source is high, and this ensures high signal in the mass pack. The other major factor is the duty cycle of MS MS acquisition, which is this proportion of ions which are actually getting fragmented. And remember, for DIA, this is one divided by the number of DIA windows. And the higher this is, uh, the higher the fragment ion signal it is, uh, you see in the in the mass pack, and the higher your chance that you correctly identify the peptide with confidence. Now, another factor is uh, now specific to DA, and this is the selectivity. Because uh, remember, we have the situation where we have complex spectra, which might come from uh, different peptides, isolated together by the Q1 quadrupole. 
And uh, then what we want is to have sufficient number of fragmentized from a particular peptide, which are not affected by these interferences. So it can have a situation when most fragment ions produce a clean signal. You can have a situation when uh, most fragment ions are affected by interferences from other coisoid peptides. And here the key is to separate your peptides well. So you want them separated in retention time dimension. You want to have good chromatography. Uh, you want them separated in ion mobility dimension if you're using uh, a device which supports ion mobility separation. And uh, you, of course, can have them separated in mass dimension. So if you use narrow uh, isolation windows, Q1 quadruple isolation windows, and uh, which also means that you need many of those to cover the mass range of interest, then your selectivity is better. And the interesting thing is that it seems that it's uh, rather not important or not so much important how you achieve this selectivity. So whatever way you separate the peptides, if you separate them, the spectra become nice and cleaner. Now, how you optimize the method depending on your experiment design. And basically any DA method is a balance between sensitivity and selectivity. And in order to optimize for either, you it's it just opposite requirements because sensitivity is inversely proportional to the number of windows, whereas selectivity is proportional to the number of windows. The more windows you use, the more narrow you can make them, and the less peptides are co-fragmented, the cleaner the spectra. And for high injection amounts, when you have a situation that uh, you detect most peptides in the sample, and uh, then you don't need so much sensitivity, but at the same time, your sample is very complex and you need high selectivity. For low injection amounts, it's the opposite. You detect less peptides. Many peptides just don't produce any meaningful signal whatsoever. It means they cannot interfere with anything. But at the same time, it's crucially important to be able to detect those fragment ions of those peptides. So sensitivity is the key. And for low injection amounts, you optimize by preferring uh, isolation schemes, acquisition schemes with uh, wide isolation windows and as low number of isolation windows as possible. You still don't go to a situation when you just use one single isolation window because that will be quite extreme, uh, except when uh, you have high mobility enabled instrument. I'll talk a bit later about this. Uh, but uh, in general, if, if you just compare different methods with different numbers of windows, high injection amounts will favor higher numbers of windows, low injection amounts will, fare, uh, will favor lower numbers of windows. So um, what's the specifics of fast chromatographic methods? And what happens is that if you have a long gradient, your peptides are typically very well separated in chromatographic dimension, but the shorter the gradient, the, the less good the separation, and many peptides collude at the same time. So uh, the shorter the gradient, the lower the peak capacity, and effectively in DA, this leads to high data complexity because you have this situation when you have a peptide of interest, but for a particular fragment, they, there's a high chance that there's some other peptide with uh, the same fragment mass or very close fragment mass. And the MOSFET just records the combined signal of both. And uh, the software struggles to deconvolute the signal. So fast methods are challenging. Now, uh, let's talk a bit uh, about how uh, DIA software works and uh, what determines the number of identifications you get eventually depending on the processing method. So what's important is to have theoretical information about your experiment, which is as accurate as possible. So you want to know for each peptide which exact fragment ions you might detect with highest intensities. So it can be that you have peptides of length 15. Uh, the number of theoretical fragment ions is uh, like say 25, and uh, out of those only eight or nine are detectable with high intensities. And you want to know which. And you want to know as precisely as possible the predicted detention time. You want to predict also the ion mobility value of the peptide. 
And what you also want to know is that out of all possible theoretical pipelines, for example, which you have in the sequence database, which are actually going to be detectable in your experiment. So the more accurate this information you have, the more confident eventually your search is going to be. So to illustrate why, let's consider a situation that we're trying to find a peptide in a particular mass spectrometer run, and we extract ion chromatograms across the whole retention time range for all of its fragment ions, and we get a picture like this. So we get, uh, I mean, not, not a scale, just, just to illustrate things. So we get one peak group somewhere at uh, hydrophilic retention time, uh, peak group in the middle, peak group at uh, more hydrophobic region. And the question is, which of those is correct? And it might be that all of them look kind of similar. So what helps a lot is this retention time information you might have about the peptide. So you can say, okay, only in this quite narrow retention time window, I would expect to see my peptide. It can be here, it can be here. And then the choice becomes you know, bigger. So this is the same situation with all other theoretical information you might have about your experiment. Now, um, how the software actually achieves statistical control of all discovery rights. So it looks for each peptide in the data. So it has a set of peptides it wants to find. It can be the whole sequence database. It can be a spectral library. And for each peptide, it now finds a candidate peak group via some algorithm. And the question is, which of those peak groups is true? So the way this question is usually answered nowadays is by uh, giving a Q value for each pe peptide spectrum match. And basically, if you filter your output at 1% Q value, you can say that maximum 1% of my identifications are false. So to achieve that, the software generates in silico the so-called decoy peptide queries. A decoy peptide is basically a, a Fox peptide, which doesn't exist in reality, which is typically generated by mutating in a certain way the sequence of your target peptide and then adjusting uh, the respective fragment ion masses. So you get fragment ion masses, which will correspond to some different peptide, not the real one. And you search this decoy peptide against the raw data, the same way you would search a target peptide. So you obtained uh, peak groups for the target peptides, you obtained peak groups for the decoy peptides, and then you can you could uh, calculate false discovery rates in a very naive way. So you calculate, for example, some score for those peak groups, targets, or decoys, and say, okay, at the particular score threshold, you get 10,000 targets and just 100 decoys means that you get 1% full discovery rate. Uh, a lot better way was suggested in uh, the landmark paper uh, of uh, describing the tool called MProfit, Nature Methods, in 2011. And the idea is that you don't need a single score. You can calculate many scores for each of those big groups. Uh, the primary score used typically something which reflects coelution of different fragment ions. So ideally, you want uh, these fragment ion solution profiles extracted from the data to be perfectly aligned with each other. So that basically, uh, like like three fragment ions profiles here, which are just one is a scaled version of another. And uh, but you can calculate many other scores, like for example, uh, mass mass deviations, which you see, or how precise your retention time is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can summarize them by training a machine learning model, which will produce one single co composite score, which will distinguish target peptides from decoy peptides. And this composite score typically perform a lot, a lot better than one single individual score you can, you can calculate based on uh, the peak group. The reason for that is that uh, different master runs with different settings for different sample matrices, they just behave very differently. And it might be that for one sample matrix, you would want to have at least, say, six coelutin fragments to be confident in the peptide. And for another sample matrix, it will be sufficient to have four. Or maybe with a sequence database, you require six, but with a highly specific spectral library, you just require four. So this this why it's it's good to have this inference of 
what weight to give to what characteristics of a big group automatic based on machine learning. Now, what we noticed when we developed Diane is that uh, linear discriminant analysis or similar linear methods, they are of course great, but uh, they typically don't perform very well if your data is thrown in on Gaussian. And the scores you want to calculate for peak groups, like for example, just number of much fragments, they are really non-Gaussian. And um, we thought, okay, why don't we use a more flexible method? So we developed um, a classifier based on neural networks, which turned out performs a lot, a lot better. So the confidence is a lot better and the robustness is better. And eventually this, we, we showed it in the paper that uh, this is the primary algorithm which is responsible for the ability of Diane to confidently identify peptides, no matter how short the gradient is. Remember, short gradients mean complex data, complex data, difficult to process, and neural networks appear to be the solution to this. Now, uh, I wanted to highlight uh, another aspect related to computational processing of uh, DA data, or well, actually this also applies to DDA, um, which very significantly determines the quality of the results you get. And this is the size of the search space. So typical example is a sequence database. It's a huge search space, might be millions of peptides you consider. Uh, a highly specific spectral library, maybe 100,000 peptides, 200,000 peptides, or maybe 10,000 peptides if you're looking at uh, fast plasma runs. And the difference is huge, actually. So uh, for specific spectral library, you'll have a situation like this. So you have true target matches, you have false target matches, and the decoys, uh, the scores should be distributed if you generate your decoys properly, uh, the same way as false target matches. So you have like picture like this. And if you have a huge search space, uh, you just have get like the target scores, the same distribution, the same numbers, but a lot more decoys, a lot more false targets. Now, when you set 1% false discovery rate threshold, you need to set it a lot, a lot to the right in this situation. And it means that a lot less true target matches pass it. So uh, the more uh, precursors, the more peptides you have in your search space, the worst outcome, basically. There are some ways to circumvent it for certain situations. For example, if you add extra modifications, Diane will typically be quite tolerant to that. Uh, but uh, still, it's better if, if you're specific to what you're searching. So uh, this, this, this leads us to this uh, main limitation of DA, which, uh, which was there until very recently. And that's the need to create a spectral library. So the way it used to be done is that you take your experiment, you make a pooled sample, you fractionate this offline, and you analyze each fraction on the mass spec. And um, this was typically done by DDA. Then you search those DDA data, and you create a spectral library, which is the set of detectable peptides uh, with the empirical attention times and abilities and the spectra. Um, and then when you analyze your DA experiment, you just search against the spectral library. Uh, search space is moderate, which is great. You also have this precise information about your peptides, which makes identifying things confidently a lot, a lot easier for the software. So this is why this method was used. Uh, however, it has some disadvantages. The first one is that it's quite laborious. So many labs were just skipping it. Uh, and uh, use public spectral libraries not specific to their samples, which degraded results significantly. And the second is that uh, even if you do it very thoroughly, but you have a large experiment, uh, it might be that some peptides which are detectable in your experiment will not be included in the spectral library. If something is not included in the spectral library and you analyze a DA experiment with spectral library, then you don't you don't detect it. So um, sensitivity is good, but still not ideal. Now, how can we address it? And uh, in Diane, we introduced a version of a much between runs algorithm. So this sounds the same as in MaxQuant, but it's a very different uh, concept in how it's used for DIA. And basically, we take advantage of the fact that once we analyze an experiment, we gained a lot of information which could have been used to actually analyze it better. Uh, 
So what we do, we do two pass analysis. After the first pass, we create a new spectral library, which is specific to our experiment. And then we reanalyze with the spectral library. Now, the outcome of that is that a library free search, so a search against the sequence database, can actually be made better or at least comparable to a highly specific project spectral library um, for, for most real experiments where you have heterogeneous samples and most like experiments which include at least tens of samples. Now, here's um, some sample benchmark. And to the left is uh, the result with a DGA-based library, a high quality one. So it's reanalysis of a public TeamStock Pro data set using 90 million gradient and different injection amounts of heal sample. Uh, this is DGA-based library. This is the same library plus much between runs. And we see there's a nice boost in IDs, especially for low injection amount. And this is library free. And with library free with MBR, we can actually get better numbers for 10 nanograms than with a library without MBR. So uh, to explain why this happens, let's look at another benchmark. And uh, this is the dilution series recorded again on TeamStock Pro. And please don't look at absolute numbers. So we didn't optimize the setup. It was just purely to benchmark the software. So here's the result without MBR and here's the result with MBR library free. And what we see is that the gain of MBR is the greater, the lower the injection amount. So why does it happen? And uh, the reason is in the principle of how MBR is implemented in the end. So in order for the peptide to be included in this newly created spectral library, it needs to be detectable well in a, just a single run in the experiment. So here in the experiment, we have runs with 40 nanogram injection amount, which is reasonably high. And we detect many peptides in those. Those get included in the spectral library, and then we re-extract them during the second pass with the highest possible sensitivity because the spectral library is highly project-specific from the entire experiment, including those very low injection amount runs. So, so this is the basis of how it works. And uh, we also validated uh, the performance of like the, the, the false discovery rates. Of course, there is always a danger that we will do things in such a way that false discovery rate will be inflated. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be the case. So we took special measures and modified an algorithm in a certain way to make sure that uh, false discovery rate is well controlled. And the way we benchmarked it is by uh, an experiment where some samples contain a mixture of two species, so human K462 and uh, E. coli lysate, and some samples are purely human. And when we count E. coli uh, peptides and proteins in human samples, those are known to be false, and by counting them, we can estimate the false discovery rate. And what we saw is basically, if we look at like the, those numbers, so again, uh, depending on the color, it's like human uh, first pass and after MBR, first pass E. coli after MBR, we see that MBR actually reduces the number of false IDs. So there is no inflation of DI, and actually the full discovery control is very strict. And um, here's just one example how this nicely empowers clinical proteomics. Uh, because we, we have a core facility in the Charité, and it produces lots and lots of lots of clinical data sets from collaborators. Charité is a huge medical university, and uh, we, we do lots of exciting clinical stuff. And uh, we used to analyze the data just with public spectral libraries. And here's a comparison of the difference between performance if you just use a public spectral library or use library free search plus, plus MBR. And the difference is very significant in terms of both average numbers of proteins identified, but also proteins identified consistently, and also get a benefit in terms of numbers of peptides identified per protein. And the more peptides you have per protein, the typically this means that uh, more precisely you quantify the protein. So this is really empowering. Now, um, another technology I want to talk about um, is the use of multiplexing. And multiplexing is in general very nice technology because it allows you to analyze multiple samples together on a single MOSPEC run, saves MOSPEC time. And basically the same benefit is with super high throughput methods because uh, 
you it enables large scale experiments. Um, it enables to run experiments cheaply in terms of uh, the use of mass spec time, and it enables run experiments which you otherwise wouldn't because if if you're quick, then you you can do things which are very experimental. Whereas if uh, you need to wait for months to get the mass spec time you need, then probably you're going to plan the experiment very well and only do things you're very confident in. So the throughput is an enabling thing, and. Um, also, it can you can you can do other things in multiplexing, like using internal quantification standards to reduce batch effects. Like you multiplex your samples of interest with some pooled sample, and this pooled sample is all the same in all the injections in the mass spec. And you can also benefit if you do that from the carry effect. If your pooled sample is a lot more abundant than your samples of interest, and then you just need to identify a peptide in the pool sample and only quantify, no need to identify and like determine the exact retention time in the other channels. But with DDA, multiplexing has two problems. So first of all, uh, there are still missing values between uh, different batches. So, for example, you have a TMT experiment and you multiply some samples, but the moment you want to scale it to hundreds of samples, you'll have different batches, and between the batches, you'll have missing values as in regular DDA. And uh, this is a problem. And the other problem you have is if you do non isobaric multiplexing like SILAC, then uh, the complexity of the MS1 spectrum increases. And in DDA, this leads to uh, usually quite significant reduction in identification rates. So we thought, okay, can we use DIA at least with non-isobaric multiplexing? And in fact, yes, the answer is yes, it's possible. And uh, what we see is there's just a very minimal reduction in identification numbers. And effectively, all the advantages of DA this uh, like uh, high robustness, high data completeness, and um, good quantification, they all remain. So um, we developed this in collaboration with uh, Nikolai Slavov lab in US. And um, we have basically two workflows streamlined in the moment. One is with MTRAC, so it allows for three plex labeling, and uh, another one with SILAC. And uh, we also developed some computational algorithms which enhance the performance of multiplexing and basically enable all this, um, which are based on two ideas. The first one is that, and, and, and here's the illustration if you have just two channels, but you can have uh, the, the same algorithms work for arbitrary number of channels, basically. There, there are two ideas. The first one is that you only need to identify your peptide in a single channel. Once you do that, you know the exact retention time, all we need to do in other channels is just integrate the signal. And the second is that you can calculate the ratios between different channels very precisely. Because you have a situation, say you have uh, multiple fragment ions in one channel, multiple fragment ions matching in another channel, and you can calculate the ratio for each pair of fragment ions. But for some of them, the signal is poor, it's very noisy. For some of them, it's good. So you can choose the fragment ions for which the signal is good and calculate the ratio very precisely. So this uh, ability to calculate ratios also improves general quantification when using multiplexing. And um, here's some example of how we used it. So we thought, okay, uh, multiplexing is the way to boost throughput. And it's particularly useful when we cannot boost throughput the other ways. For example, if we do single cell proteomics and we want to use low throughput nanoflow chromatography. Um, so this is actually a benchmark on uh, TeamStoff SCP. So the latest generation TeamStoff instrument from Bruca. And this is actually quite a fast nanoflow gradient. So it's a 30 minute method and 15 minute active gradient. But since we multiplexed uh, using Amtrak, three channels in a single sample. We measured three single cells in that 15 minute gradient, so it's actually five minute active gradient per cell. And we were able to identify decent numbers of proteins per cell. So in this case, so like several types of cell lines, we're getting about 1000 proteins per cell. Also with a decent data completeness and um, 
I mean, we'll, we also, of course, validated uh, that we've seen what we think we are seeing by just looking at the quantities of proteins in a single cell against the quantities in 100 cells. This is definitely correctly quantified, but we see that this correlates well. So it means that here we're also mostly detecting what we think we're detecting, just a basic sanity test. And uh, finally, I would like to talk about this slice passive technology, which uh, we recently developed to also boost uh, proteomics of uh, low sample amounts. So let's talk a bit about uh, DIA passive. So DIA passive is uh, the first technology uh, for DIA introduced for team stop instruments. And uh, basically, these instruments, they have uh, ability to separate peptides, not just in mass dimension, but also in immobility dimension. So you have uh, a cloud of uh, all precursor ions, which looks about like this. So th this is like the de density overlaid with an acquisition scheme. And then you select uh, for fragmentation precursors in this cloud using uh, windows, not just in iron mobility dimension, but also in, uh, not just in mass dimension, but also in iron mobility dimension. So in fact, the way this works is that a instrument gradually releases ions depending on their ion mobility and goes like this. So it releases, 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 and while it does so, it acquires this mass isolation window. Then it goes here, switches the mass isolation window, it keeps releasing. Then again, switches mass isolation window, keeps releasing. So each such a release of all precursor ions, depending on their ion mobility, gradually form higher one or zero values. Doesn't matter what it means now, but uh, just like some kind of notation from higher values to lower values. It's called a frame. And uh, the thing is that the duty cycle, a mass mass duty cycle in case of DA passive is determined not by the number of windows per se, but rather by the number of frames. So in this example, there are 24 mass isolation windows, uh, but just eight frames, and the duty cycle is 108, which is 12.5%, which is a lot, a lot higher than you typically see in uh, in instruments which don't have this iron mobility capability. Uh, this is one of the benefits of DA passive. It just boosts sensitivity several fold because of this. Now, the second benefit is that this iron mobility separation itself improves separation of peptides. And remember, uh, DIA scheme is always a balance, a compromise between sensitivity and selectivity. So here, selectivity is boosted several fold simply because we have this extra iron mobility dimension, which means that we can afford having larger isolation windows, which in turn increases sensitivity further. So not just we get better separation, but we get better sensitivity because we shift the balance between selectivity and sensitivity. And we also get better sensitivity because we analyze multiple windows uh, at the same frame, in the same frame, in such a way that uh, sensitivity doesn't drop. So DAE passive is an excellent method, uh, but uh, it had one limitation. And it was basically that these windows being acquired they are all non-overlapping in mass dimension. And we thought, okay, what if we don't need to adhere to this limitation? So uh, we modified our software and optimized the method. And we saw that there are actually huge benefits in certain scenarios to not comply with this limitation. Uh, so we developed a series of methods, which we call slice passive. And uh, this, this example, this may be a simplest method, but also the best for single cells, which we call one frame. And uh, here we just gradually move the mass isolation window where the instrument is releasing ions, depending on their ion mobility. So uh, another option is that we slice this precursor ion space, hence the name slice passive, in several slices, and uh, we acquire uh, each slice with a particular frame. What we can also do is move the boundary between the slices between different cycles. So in one DIA cycle, we have one boundary, another, another boundary, and third bound, uh, in third cycle, we have third boundary. And this also helps selectivity. So we get extra mass information. <laughs> 
So we basically have this uh, a family of methods, one frame, multi-frame, and two frame with a shifting boundary. And uh, here are some benchmarks of how this performs. So this is a dilution series of a human K562 digest and uh, measured with a five minute gradient on an analytical flow LC system. So this is very high flow rate. This is typically not what you would use for high sensitivity proteomics, but this is excellent for benchmarking the mass pack because it's it just like super robust system. You will make multiple injections in a row and the numbers are very stable because chromatography is very stable and the spray is very stable. So for benchmarking, this, this is why we use it for benchmarking. So um, if we go down to 10 nanograms on this system, which is very, very low injection amount for this kind of flow rate, um, then we're about uh, at an equivalent of low single cell uh, sample amounts if we were to acquire on a nanoflow system. And what we saw when we compared different methods like regular DA passive, um, uh, about the same, like about the same comparable method was used by um, uh, Matthias Mann group uh, in developing their single cell method in Team Stoff. So this is uh, quite an optimized DA passive for sensitivity. We compared to the one frame, two frame, and four frame slice passive methods, and what we saw is that the lower the injection amount, the greater the performance of slice passive. So at 10 nanograms, there is just huge advantage in terms of protein numbers, and most importantly, proteins which are quantified properly, like with less than 10% CVs. So it's a full change advantage, actually. Um, in, there's kind of a parity in terms of total numbers at about 100 nanograms, and at 1,000 nanograms, uh, DA passive wins. But at the same time, uh, slice passive still is better in terms of precisely quantifying large numbers of proteins. So what we see here is the classical balance between selectivity and sensitivity. DA passive is the more selective, 25 Dalton windows. Slice passive one frame is the more sensitive, 100% duty cycle. Every single precursor ion which uh, gets fragmented uh, like using this MSMS acquisition. High injection amounts, selectivity more important, low injection amounts, sensitivity is a lot, a lot more important. And uh, we thought, okay, so we boosted a lot the sensitivity of the method. Can we, what, what can we gain from it in terms of our uh, ability to do new experiments? And uh, in single cell proteomics, typically one would previously use a low flow rate nanoflow system which limits throughput and also nanoflow is uh, is more difficult to work with LC and uh, requires uh, like people with very high expertise in tuning this and troubleshooting this and also you, you cannot just run thousands of samples without interruption without changing the column and uh, we thought okay can we do actually single cell proteomics with microflow at the high flow uh, at, at the high throughput? And the answer is yes. So what we try to do, we uh, use this EVASAP system, which has 200 samples per day, microflow method. It's two microliters a minute flow rate. And uh, we looked at the performance of size passive. And uh, we get about 1.4 thousand proteins quantified from 200 picograms of HeLa. Also with, with quite nice coefficient of variation of 14% uh, median. So, so this is very decent and um, very workable for various kinds of biological inference. So uh, the conclusion is that basically the advances in sensitivity of the instrument and the acquisition method, they, they allow to go for microflow fluoroids when analyzing single cell level sample amounts. So 200 picograms is roughly what you, I mean, you would expect about the same numbers from uh, HeLa cells uh, sample prep on, uh, on a cell in one instrument, for example. Okay, so, so, uh, that's, that's how I would like to finish my talk. And I would like to thank my collaborators and my lab members, of course. So my lab and and uh, like in general, the Institute of Biochemistry at the Charité. Also I have colleagues from University of Michigan in US and Northeastern University in US and uh, our colleagues from Bruca. Thank you. Awesome.
this was fascinating. Thank you so much, Vadim, for this for this great lecture and uh, the new insights. It was really cool. Um, yeah, I think before we move on to the questions, yeah, I just want to thank everybody again for stopping by, and yeah, especially you, Vadim, for giving the lecture. And I hope to see you next time. Okay, and.